How many different emotions are there and how nuanced are they? Because boredom can actually have a handful of different types of boredom. Well, the whole world of emotion is pretty interesting. At the root of it, there are only something like six basic emotions. And they're the big ones. They're angry and happy and disgusted and guilty. And so, you know, in psychology, everything comes down to about six, but then the nuances do come in. And so we have uh, a, we have 17 separate emotions in our data set, and it's a spectrum of pain and pleasure. And we put a midpoint in there of indifference. And we wanted this to be um, whatever, you know, and we needed the whatever, I'm whatever, I'm fine, I'm, I'm contented. In our pilot study, we didn't have an, the emotion of contented in there. And I think we had really elevated levels of happiness. Sort of like, I'm happy, it's fine. But I, we needed happiness to be a more elated state than that. And so by giving people contented as an option in the, in the research, we were able to, to see, uh, you know, uh, I'm fine. Um, we, we definitely see contentment and happiness as the most predominant emotions, but even um, as happy as this country is, 76% you know, of Americans are happy at some point during the day, but they only spend about five hours a day all told in a state of happiness. So that's a lot of other emotions happening throughout the day. Um, see about half hour a day in angry states and um, at one of the, the activities we have that's very close to um, to an emotion is the state of doing nothing in particular so it is it's bored and doing nothing in particular and and there you have to interpret whether that's a positive state or a negative state for your category we know that um, in the UK a, an agency put a whole travel campaign together based on when people are doing nothing in particular and they they determined that that would be an ideal dream state, so a dream of a great vacation. So they found those half hours or those times of the day and times of the week and, and ran that campaign to, to great success. So um, that there's a, an interesting interplay between uh, emotions and, and activities. Um, we see that there are some activities that are really good investments of time, that when you, you do them and you aren't feeling particularly good before you do them, but then you do them and afterwards you feel really good. So childcare is one of those uh, activities where people you know, who do it a lot aren't particularly in, in a, a, a high energy state and they're not feeling pretty good, but it pays rewards. Afterwards they feel good doing it. Work is exactly the opposite of that. Work will put people in bad moods. In fact, the dominant work emotions so often we see is overwhelmed, frustrated, worried, bored. You know, if the negative emotions are going to show up, it's either going to be commuting or, or working. So um, we see a lot of happiness when uh, and loving when husbands and wives are together. Um, not always, because husbands and wives actually spend quite a little bit of time together. It's so little how much time husbands and wives actually have together as a, as a couple. But th those are great opportunities for high ticket items to, you know, like, like cars or vacations when you need both people in agreement in a household to buy something like that. So uh, it's fun to be able to see those pockets of opportunity for different categories. Are there certain um, networks or websites or other forms of media that have a certain level of emotion? That they, do they parse by emotion? It certainly depends on the content of the of the network. Sports, for instance, is a very ex is, is a, a, a genre that's associated with excitement and some anxiety. You can actually see when people are watching live sports events. You can see their emotions change, you know, throughout the the game or the match. So depending on what's actually happening. So the sports, in general, as a genre, is very excited and and people tend to be um, happy and very engaged in that. Um, now I wouldn't say that we've seen individual networks vary um, be by an emotional state. And um, it's really more about um, the time period and what people are, are doing or what they're experiencing at the time.
So beyond the measurement of emotion, which I personally find very fascinating, uh, what else does your service provide? Well, I think we have the only source of, of the full context, the full spectrum of the environment that uh, people are experiencing throughout their daily life. Uh, we have social setting, which is when different people are around us and they're influencing us. Um, you know, it, we have um, the ability to see when social setting changes throughout the day and the impact that has in the media that's in play when people are out with their friends, uh, you know, on a Thursday night going to a bar or a restaurant, um, you know, we can see the whole process of, of being at home and, and watching television and then someone getting in their car and experiencing the radio on the way to a, um, to a bar or restaurant to meet up with their friends. And you can see them, you know, uh, in our data, you can see them, uh, you know, eating and a, a television is on in a bar and then they go home at the end of the night and we can track them all the way through a, a particular Thursday night. So it provides this idea of who are they with, which influences mood and it influences, you know, receptivity to messages. <clears throat> and then we can tell where they are. And, um, and this whole notion of, of being able to understand things that happen in time. Um, it's, it's very big and it's very different and it's very important and I think that's one of the the, the strengths of, of touch points is the the element of timing so that you can see the sequencing of events or the way things happen or what happened along the way to a, a shopping trip you know um, what media took place where did they stop before what's the chain of, of stores or errands that people run on Saturday morning you can see all of that in this data and then marketers can take advantage of that kind of, of information in ways that they've never ha been able to before. We've done a great job in the industry of, of understanding who people are and what touch points adds is is where are they and, and when are they places or when are they in a particular mood or when are they with people who will influence their thinking. So that's what we bring a whole different dimension, five different dimensions of context and, and, and context is, is hugely important to, um, to advertising. It really influences the extent to which we pay attention to messages or remember messages or act on messages. What are the five dimensions of context? The five dimensions of context are location, social setting, who are you with, um, what are you doing, you know, whether you're doing nothing or whether you're doing something really engaging, uh, um, mood and emotion, and then the media environment, so the five different contextual environments. And we know an awful lot about the media environment. You know, um, we've, we've played on appropriate context uh, in, in all the way through all of media planning. You know, where do I put this ad? Do I put this ad in a magazine, an endemic magazine, that is, is exactly what my category is all about? Do I put a fragrance ad in a beauty magazine? Of course you do. You wouldn't put it in an outdoor magazine or something like that. So we understand the ability of the media to sort of synergistically uh, operate uh, and the mindset that people bring to particular media. And what USA Touch Points does is it just brings that to a broader base of media. So it's so you can find the um, appropriate, contextually appropriate media and moments uh, with this data set. I know that it probably varies by advertiser and varies by media platform, but are there certain truisms of what constitutes uh, the perfect state for tentativeness and possibly a call to action? Well, I think it's going to be about um, your judgment in an individ individual category. But you could argue that when someone is alone, they might be paying more attention to a message or a medium that they're experiencing. You might argue that not doing more than one thing at a time. So minimal amount of multitasking might be a good environment for, uh, for or hypotheses for paying quite a bit of attention. Um, you could argue that uh, only doing one thing, only experiencing one medium at a time, and being on your own could be an ideal set of circumstances for particular types of messages. 
On the other hand, um, if you are craft macaroni and cheese and you want to drive requests by the kids, you might consider the mom more attentive in the car when she's with her kids and they're you know, talking about life and, and you know, just sort of like a, a mom and child moment would be per perhaps perfect for you know, a, a category like that. So the fun thing about this data set is that it's all there. You bring your hypotheses to this data set and, and see whether or not the, the intersection of, of media and, and location and place and, and social setting is, is right for you. You know, you can find it's all there.